joining. So I'm so I'm going to introduce the film. Um, so we are watching Segregated by Design, which examines the forgotten history of our federal, state, and local governments um, and how they unconstitutionally segregated every major me metropolitan area in the United States. Um, the film basically breaks down how the unconstitutional residential policies in the U.S. Um, throughout the middle of the 20th century, um, how they enacted these policies and how they directly impacted, impacted and created a negative view today on neighborhoods and where African-Americans live and overall African-Americans as a culture. Um, the film is based on the book, um, The Color of Law, A Forgetting History of Our, gov of our Government Segregated America. And um, again, this book basically just shows how everything was promoted to in discriminatory, discriminatory patterns that continue today. So we're very eager to watch this. Um, I know there's a lot of conversations in regards to redlining, to um, you know, just all of the neighborhoods in general, and um, you know, just it's a lot in regards to how we live and cultures. Um, so we're we're really eager about this event. We hope you all are excited. Um, so I believe we're going to start off watching the film first, and then we're going to have a dialogue um, with myself and Hernan and take any questions and that the, um, anyone in the audience may have. Colleen, if you could, um, to start sharing the perfect. In the middle of the 20th century, the city of St. Louis, Missouri, and the United States federal government condemned and demolished the neighborhoods in downtown St. Louis where African Americans lived, displacing thousands. They built the Gateway Arch. They built a university, interstate highways, hospitals, and middle-class housing that was unaffordable to the former African-American residents. Those who were displaced then relocated to the few other places available, converting inner ring suburbs like Ferguson into new segregated enclaves. We have been led to believe that racial segregation in housing was de facto segregation, by accident or the result of private prejudices. Yes, private prejudice clearly contributed to segregation, but by itself it could not have segregated the country without the intention of the federal government to segregate neighborhoods throughout the nation. If, however, we understand the accurate history, the history that was once well known, but we've all now forgotten, that racially segregated patterns in every metropolitan area like St. Louis were created by de jure segregation. Racially explicit policy on the part of federal, state, and local governments designed to segregate metropolitan areas, then we can understand that we have an unconstitutional residential landscape. And if it's unconstitutional, then we have an obligation to remedy it. The federal government and the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration of the 1930s pursued policies in the mid-20th century that segregated metropolitan areas. One important policy was the first civilian public housing program, which frequently demolished integrated neighborhoods in order to create segregated public housing. In the late 1930s, another New Deal program, the United States Housing Authority, was adopted. The very first projects built under the United States Housing Authority authorization were in Austin, Texas, because the most aggressive proponent of public housing at that time was the congressman from Austin, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson got the United States Housing Authority to put its first projects in Austin, separate projects for whites, for African Americans, and a project for Hispanics. The project for African Americans was placed in a location that the city plan of Austin had designated as a ghetto for African Americans. The United States Housing Authority and the local Austin Housing Authority demolished something called Emancipation Park which was a celebrations location for the abolition of slavery. The design was to move all African Americans in the city of Austin into this community, whether in public housing or in private housing. The city of Austin then began to close schools for African Americans elsewhere in the city and close libraries and other public facilities to force African Americans to move to the east side. 
Another program that the federal government pursued to enforce segregation was the work of the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, which subsidized the development of suburbs like Levittown, New York, on condition that they only be sold to white families and that the homes in those suburbs had deeds that prohibited resale to African Americans. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual said that inharmonious racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities, meaning that loans to African Americans could not be insured. Government at all levels throughout the nation were involved in promoting and enforcing the restrictive deeds in homes and places like Levittown, and judges enforced the view that these deeds did not violate the Constitution because they were private agreements. Although white middle-class families that moved into suburbs like Levittown could buy property with no down payments if they were veterans and low-interest mortgages, middle-class African Americans had to make substantial down payments and get uninsured mortgages with higher interest rates. In many, if not most cases, African Americans could not get mortgages at all because the federal government would not insure them. As a result, they bought their homes on contract, like an installment plan where they accumulated no equity and could be evicted from their homes in the event of a single missed payment. Thus, contract buyers did not have the option of leaving a declining neighborhood before their properties were paid for in full. If they did, they would lose everything they'd invested in that property to date. The term redlining comes from the federal government's creation of maps of urban areas nationwide. And those maps were color-coded to indicate where it was safe to insure mortgages. Anywhere African Americans lived, even places where African Americans lived nearby, were colored red to indicate to appraisers that these neighborhoods were too risky for the FHA to insure. The FHA's justification was that if African Americans bought homes in white neighborhoods, or even if they bought homes near those neighborhoods, the property values of the homes they were insuring, the white homes they were insuring, would decline, and therefore their loans would be at risk. In 1940, for example, a Detroit builder was denied FHA insurance for a project that was near an African-American neighborhood. He then constructed a half-mile concrete wall, six feet high and a foot thick, separating the two neighborhoods, and then the FHA approved the loan. In the three decades during which it administered this policy, however, the agency never provided or obtained evidence to support its claim that integration undermined property values. In fact, often racial integration caused property values to increase because African Americans' housing supply was so restricted and they had so many fewer choices. If African Americans had access to housing throughout metropolitan areas, supply and demand balances would have kept their rents and home prices at reasonable levels. Without access, landlords and sellers were free to take advantage of the greater demand relative to supply for African American housing. A 1946 National Magazine article described the Chicago building where the landlord had divided a 540-square-foot storefront into six cubicles, each housing a family. He had similarly subdivided the second story. Total monthly rent was as great as that generated by a luxury apartment on Chicago's Gold Coast along Lake Michigan. Such exploitation was possible only because public policy denied African Americans opportunities to participate in the city's white housing market. As the federal government concentrated low-income African Americans in single neighborhoods, the homes became overcrowded. Families had to subdivide their homes to make their mortgage payments or their property tax payments. Cities frequently withdrew public services from African American neighborhoods. They collected garbage less frequently. They didn't provide water and sewer services. Polluting industry and toxic waste plants were placed in African American communities in order to protect white neighborhoods from deterioration. The result was that African American neighborhoods frequently turned into slums. White homeowners looked at these places and assumed that slum conditions were characteristics of African Americans, not of government policy that forced this kind of overcrowding. White homeowners then became resistant to African Americans moving into their neighborhoods because they thought they would bring slum conditions with them. Of course, the slums were not created by the people. They were created by the forced concentration, the overcrowding in these neighborhoods. Blockbusting was a scheme in which speculators bought properties in borderline black-white areas, rented or sold them to African-American families at above-market prices, 
persuaded white families residing in these areas that their neighborhoods were turning into African-American slums and that values would soon fall precipitously, and then purchased the panicked white homes for less than their worth. Blockbuster's tactics included hiring African-American women to push carriages with their babies through white neighborhoods, hiring African-American men to drive cars with radios blasting through white neighborhoods, or making random telephone calls to residents of white neighborhoods and asking to speak to someone with a stereotypically African-American name, like Johnny May. State licensing agencies that regulated real estate agents could have easily stopped this practice. All they had to do was to lift the license of one or two real estate agents who engaged in these practices, and the practices would have ended. While many de jure segregation policies aim to keep African Americans far from white residential areas, public officials also shifted African American populations away from downtown business districts so that white commuters, shoppers, and business elites would not be exposed to black people. This was accomplished with slum clearance. One slum clearance tool was the construction of the federal interstate highway system. In many cases, state and local governments, with federal acquiescence, designed interstate highway routes to destroy urban African American communities. In the 1950s, there was a white middle class neighborhood in Los Angeles that wealthy African Americans began to move into. It was called Sugar Hill. The first thing that happened was that the Neighborhood Association got together and tried to buy out the African American families who were moving in, offering them more money than the African Americans had paid in order to get them out of the neighborhood. When that didn't work, white homeowners tried to enforce a legal agreement prohibiting them from living in the neighborhood. And when that didn't work, the city council then decided it would be an African American neighborhood. It rezoned it for multiple family housing. It eventually became a slum. And then the Santa Monica Freeway was built to clear that slum to destroy the neighborhood. So these policies all worked together in an unconstitutional fashion to segregate Los Angeles. In 1957, Bill and Daisy Myers were able to purchase a home in Levittown, Pennsylvania, the Levitt Company's second large development. When the mail carrier discovered that he was delivering mail to an African-American family, he let everyone in the neighborhood know, and as many as 600 white demonstrators soon showed up in front of the Myers' house, pelting the family and their home with rocks. Law enforcement stood by as this happened. For two months, rocks were thrown, crosses were burned, the Ku Klux Klan symbol was painted on the wall next door. Some policemen stood with the mob, joking and encouraging its participants. One sergeant was actually demoted to patrolman because he objected to orders he had been given not to interfere with the rioters. In 1951, World War II veteran Harvey Clark, his wife Janetta, and two small children rented an apartment in Old White Cicero, a suburb of Chicago. When the Clarks refused to leave, a mob of 4,000 rioted, raiding the apartment, destroying the fixtures, and throwing the family's belongings out the window onto the lawn where they were set ablaze. Time magazine reported that the police officers present, quote, acted like ushers politely handling the overflow of the football stadium, unquote. The only people that the grand jury indicted were Harvey Clark, his real estate agent, his NAACP attorney, and the white landlady who rented the apartment to him, as well as her attorney, on charges of inciting a riot and conspiring to lower property values. Stories like this were commonplace, and state-sponsored violence was a means, along with many others, by which all levels of government maintained segregation. Today, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes. But African-American wealth is about 10% of white wealth. Most middle-class families in this country gain their wealth from the equity they have in their homes. So this enormous difference between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is almost entirely attributable to federal housing policy implemented through the 20th century. African-American families that were prohibited from buying homes in the suburbs in the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s by the Federal Housing Administration, gained none of the equity appreciation that whites gained. Across the country in new developments, these homes in the late 1940s and 1950s sold for about twice national median income, 
They were affordable to working class families with an FHA or VA mortgage. African Americans were equally able to afford those homes as whites, but were prohibited from buying them. Today, those homes sell for $300,000 to $400,000 at the minimum, six to eight times national median income. The white families sent their children to college with the wealth they gained from appreciating home equity. They were able to take care of their parents in old age and not depend on their children. They were able to bequeath wealth to their children. None of those advantages accrued to African Americans, who for the most part were prohibited from buying homes in those suburbs. So in 1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act that said, in effect, okay, African Americans, you're now free to buy homes in the suburbs that had been forbidden. But it's an empty promise, because those homes are no longer affordable to the families whose parents or grandparents could have afforded them when whites were buying into those suburbs and gaining the equity and wealth that followed from their purchases. Consider children who come from families where they're economically stressed, or in poor health because they have no access to good health care, or because they live in polluted environments. When they do come to school, for example, they may suffer from asthma because of that pollution and are drowsy from being awake at night wheezing. They cannot then typically achieve at levels of children who come to school well rested. When you concentrate children like that in single classrooms, it's impossible for teachers to develop the kind of outcomes that they can in middle class children who come to school healthy, unstressed, and able to pay attention to schooling. What economists know is that African-American children from low-income families who grow up in segregated neighborhoods are less likely as adults to move into the middle class than are African-American children whose families have the same low incomes but who live in integrated neighborhoods. So segregation itself impedes intergenerational mobility and perpetuates, rigidifies the inequality that we experience. Another thing that social psychologists have discovered is that decision-making is hampered when you don't have diverse decision-making groups. These psychologists have done experiments where they put people together to solve problems in both diverse groups and in segregated groups. And the diverse groups are much better able to solve problems because they challenge assumptions much more than the segregated groups do. So segregation impedes our political and economic success. We have three provisions in the federal constitution that prohibit the kinds of actions that federal, state, and local governments pursued to create residential segregation. One is the Fifth Amendment, which requires the federal government to treat all citizens fairly. Another is the Fourteenth Amendment, that requires state and local governments not only to treat citizens fairly, but to treat them equally. And then the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, also requires that we banish the effects of slavery, which Congress long ago determined was any form of second-class citizenship. So in fact, the prohibition on African Americans to purchase homes in federally subsidized white communities or the segregation of public housing created a form of second-class citizenship, which was a violation of the 13th Amendment. We cannot reverse the jury segregation mainly with lawsuits. We must also build a national political consensus leading to legislation, a challenging but not impossible task. Our focus now should be to develop policies that promote an integrated society, understanding it will be impossible to fully untangle the web of unconstitutional inequality that we've woven. To begin, we should first contemplate what we have collectively done and, on behalf of our government, accept responsibility to fix it. going to um, open it up for questions, but at first I want to introduce um, our speaker in depth so everyone can know who he is. Um, Hernan Guerrero Applewhite is an urban planning and design professional focused on community 
development and assisting communities conceptualize and build great places. Over the past two decades, Hernan has worked in public, private, and nonprofit sectors of, human, of urban planning and design ranging from spatial analysis to master planning. Currently, Hernan is the CEO and president of Urban Consulting. His role includes coordinating the consulting capital initiatives to help developers and the city of Miami identify funding and pathways to increase the production of affordable housing units. Previously, Hernan served as the community development director at Neighborhood Housing Services of South Florida, coordinating an effort to revitalize the Northwest 79th Street Community Redevelopment Area. In addition to this, Hernan is an educator and professor at Florida International University and is an active member and contributor to the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. Without further ado, Hernan Guerrero Applewhite. Thank you, thank you, um, everyone. I think I know uh, probably more than half of the people on the call um, and uh, very happy to be here tonight. Um, I believe um, you were right. You were asking people to ask questions. Are we fielding questions? Um, are we allowing people to kind of ask? Because I see Christine has her, her hand up. Yes, if anyone has a question, they can type it in the chat. We'll read the questions and have dialogue. Okay. Um, but we do have a, pre a few questions also prepared. Um, again, I know the conversation is always uh, of um, redlining and, and all of these things that are happening in our city. And we, I mean, I think the first question is always, what's the solution now? Um, versus we, now that we've identified the problem, you know, I always ask, what's new? What's the question? Um, and what's the solution to the questions? And so I think I would like to start off in saying, you know, how has redlining affected the community in Miami in general? Um, because okay. there's a lot of things going on right now in Overtown um, with the new highways being built um, and the way that Wynwood is constantly um, changing and the way that they're developing these borders to completely like close in. So I kind of, you know, definitely, I think that's something that we can all to kick off the conversation. Sure. Well, um, I think I can share my screen actually, um, or I don't know if you want to do the uh, Nadine either way. Um, yeah, you can share your screen. Okay, share my screen real quick here then. And while I'm while I'm getting that ready, yes, thanks, uh, Terry, for the question. Um, I have a couple of slides actually that will help kind of um, uh, frame my response to what you're saying uh, because it's right. We just had a, a really. Um, we looked at a really interesting video. Um, I'm not sure how many of our viewers have actually read uh, The Color of Law uh, book by Leland Roth. If you have not, um, I really encourage you uh, to read it. It's an eye opener uh, to reading, you know, chapter after chapter examples of uh, how across the country um, uh, our, you know, our governments, because, you know, it's yes, there's the federal government, but then there's the state governments and in the local jurisdictions, right, um, actively uh, contributed uh, to segregating uh, our society. So here we are, let me just find my share right here. And so this is a um, redlining map of Miami. I hope everyone can see that, can everyone see my screen? Right, so just to orient people a little bit, right, this is Biscayne Bay, this is the Miami River down here. Right, and so we were talking about redlining. Um, just to characterize redlining a little bit further, they uh, touched briefly on it, I believe, in the video. Uh, I believe, assuming that everyone kind of has a little bit of a background, you see in our background of our images, you know, um, redlining maps. Uh, and what these colors refer to is typically that red uh, would connote uh, neighborhoods where uh, blacks and foreign born populations lived, right? Uh, I forget what the other colors still, okay, so blue was still desirable uh, and yellow was definitely declining. So that was where, um, you know, there were, um, and, and these maps, by the way, were created at a time uh, when um, black and brown people uh, were finally uh, being able to get access to higher paying jobs. Right and uh, having the buying power to begin to buy into um, white neighborhoods, right? Um, 
what happened after that, right, is across the country, uh, we began to refer to those areas that were previously occupied by uh, many white families um, and that would quickly became overpopulated by black people as inner city because most of them were close to the city. These were, you know, um, these were desirable locations because you would be within uh, close proximity to, you know, work. You could walk to work potentially, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as um, the suburbs were created and hand in hand with the creation of the Federal Hi Highway Administration, uh, as was being described in the um, documentary, uh, the phenomenon of white flight begins where uh, white people, you know, move in droves, uh, practically in exodus to the suburbs, uh, leaving black and brown people behind in what becomes the inner city. And as the uh, documentary said, over time, uh, services begin to decline in those areas, right? Um, so this would be a picture of kind of Leviton, right, and the creation of the suburbs, right? And these would be some of the pictures that you would see um, of uh, Overtown, some of the overcrowding that was happening uh, in the early 1920s, uh, where um, uh, Blacks were still living in conditions uh, very different than uh, their white counterparts. Um, that being said, Overtown uh, itself was pretty built out. So this is a black and white aerial that shows you, uh, all, you know, the city before I-95 was built. Um, and uh, uh, many people describe Overtown um, for Miami having been as successful of a black neighborhood as Harlem was in New York, right? Um, uh, so much so that um, black artists, for instance, would come down uh, to Miami and would go and perform on Miami Beach uh, where they could not stay, right? They had to get a pass to be able to get onto the beach and then they could not reside there. So. Uh, after their performances, they would basically have to go to uh, black neighborhoods to reside there, where they would then also perform. Um, and so, Overtown was believed to be to have been um, a densely populated, but you know, fairly successful neighborhood. You can kind of see here the footprint of the buildings that existed. Uh, I believe this is the. Uh, I don't remember the name of this church. This is the uh, church that Mount Zion Church that is still on Third Avenue today. Uh, so here you can begin to see the there's an arrow showing the clearance of several homes and many blocks for the construction of I-95. And of course, I-95 is an interstate that stretches throughout the entire East Coast. So um, unfortunately, it had this devastating effect throughout many Black neighborhoods throughout the East Coast. Uh, but this is certainly how it affected uh, Overtown um to the point where we know this very well um and this kind of interchange uh that you know still goes right smack through the middle of overtown right where you see um the women's prison right across from Booker T. washington high school's playground right and over here is camilla's house and over here are some of the homes of um uh, i believe there's still a mismatch of public housing but also garden style apartments uh, a level of density and, and, and zoning that could never be rebuilt in this area today. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going a little bit perhaps beyond what the original question was, uh, but I think it's important to reflect on where we stand today, where um, T.Y. Lin uh, International um, designed and engineered this, uh, what they call, are calling a signature bridge uh which is going to basically sediment the existence of this um you know highway uh through the community um it's supposed to increase uh uh mobility currently uh it's contributing to a lot of flooding in downtown um i would like to be uh perhaps optimistic about this uh but frankly um it is uh daunting to me and it's interesting because you know you can see these curvy linear elements of this kind of uh you know suspension bridge uh with the metro rail you know kind of loop over here right and so um at the same time that we have uh, kind of decided within the city of miami itself um, that the highest density belongs in this area rather than figuring out like other cities are doing like boston for instance that has uh you know 
uh, brought their um, elevated highway underground. Uh, cities like Seattle um, that are also bringing down elevated highways, even internationally cities like Rio de Janeiro, right, are, are moving away from these kind of solutions and moving more towards mass transit uh, systems. Uh, this was described as a signature bridge uh, for the 21st century. Um, you know, uh, when I think of signature bridge, I think of something that is uh, symbolic of, you know, progress in the future. Um, and, you know, I I'm trying here, I'm trying to be very diplomatic, <laughs> but I am, I, I'm, 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 I frequently find myself asking more questions about, you know, why more, um, you know, pedestrian, pedestrian safety elements, for instance, were not considered, you know, uh, uh, but I believe that uh, this is because the highway typology is still, you know, a level of service mentality. Um, and I think I might be getting a little bit into the weeds here. So please bring me back. Uh, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's all of your wisdom and good information and how other cities are working. So we're, I think we're all eating up this, uh, your dialogue right now. Maybe to shift towards, uh, you know, more positive things, what I'll do is share just a couple of additional images to kind of characterize other things that were mentioned in the uh, documentary. For instance, the fact that during the FDR administration, you know, on the heels of obviously the Great Depression uh, and extreme poverty and homelessness that was created throughout the uh, uh, Great Depression, which is important to char characterize, uh, which didn't just affect Black people, it affected white people as well. Um, there was a period of kind of regrowth, resurgence uh, that unfortunately um, Blacks were not able to uh, take a, uh, a advantage of. Uh, this increased rapidly after World War II. Uh, but during the FDR administration, uh, one thing that was uh, conceived of was providing public housing uh, for uh, uh, Black families. And at that time, um, Liberty uh, City, affectionately dubbed the uh, pork and beans uh, was created at the time. It was one of the largest public housing developments uh, in the country. Uh, it was developed as this very quaint kind of higher density for the time perhaps, but lower density by our standards today. I think the largest structure was uh, two stories, uh, but you can see here they were largely designed in kind of like a, um, a typology is very common to South Florida. Um, the uh, kind of uh, ranch style homes, uh, uh, multifamily, right? So uh, conceivably, if you can see my cursor, uh, one of these kind of uh, row house developments uh, would have housed multiple families, right? Uh, some other ones, pardon me, uh, would have been multiple stories to accommodate larger um, families. Um, uh, but what, uh, and so I'll actually, I'll just talk about that. I'm just going to start talking about other things that happened afterwards, but let me just stick with this. Um, over time, uh, over the years and over the decades, uh, it went from being, uh, kind of, you know, public housing, uh, originally was really a stepping stone for, uh, providing housing solutions for low income families across the color spectrum. Right. And, uh, um, some families were able to use it as a stepping stone. Unfortunately for black families increasingly and, and, um, and minority families, it became, they became places of kind of generational poverty where uh, people could not kind of break the cycle of, uh, you know, if, you know uh, kind of, uh, you know, rising up the, the food chain um, and being able to move on up. I was a big fan of the Jeffersons uh, growing up in the eighties, you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, people did not have the, the ability to move on up and move into that nice, you know, uh, penthouse, right? Um, and over time, it became really the lore of, you know, kind of like what they were referring to in the documentary, kind of, uh, you know, uh, you would see, you know, the pork and beans projects in uh, COPS next 48 hours. Um, and so it had this stigma, still has a stigma of, you know, this very dangerous place where nobody should, you know, <laughs> nobody should should be venturing in. Um, and in uh, 2016, the county, 2016, 2017, 2018, I forgot the years now, uh, the county proposed a redevelopment of the site. They put out a request for proposals, 
a competition ensued. Uh, many different developers partnered with uh, local architects or urban design firms to propose different solutions. Um, and the winning uh, product was the urban related group uh, master plan, uh, which is currently, I believe, in its phase four uh, of construction, uh, where um, basically following a federal strategy, which is the uh, rental assistance demonstration uh, strategy that, that uh, the Federal Housing and Urban Development Administration is pursuing, uh, they're encouraging public housing authorities to increase, to redevelop uh, their existing public housing stock into um, higher density developments that can, that can help to accommodate um, uh, and hopefully attenuate for the large demand of low income um, and mixed income housing, uh, really more low income than mixed income, uh, I yeah, would say, yeah. is the strategy, right? Um, and so this strategy is being pursued across the country. Um, uh, Miami-Dade uh, has one of the largest housing authorities in the country, uh, probably behind New York City uh, and uh, maybe some other large cities, uh, municipalities. But we're going to begin to see this model uh, throughout um, um, South Florida. And then um, I think that it's always important to focus on strategies, right? Like best practices, like how do we, how do we correct this? And so um, I'm just gonna show a couple of uh, examples of what is happening in other communities, um, how people have organized to try to, uh, you know, work around uh, these kind of conditions. So one of the most famous ones is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, their story is, uh, is captured in a book called uh, Streets of Hope, uh, which uh, kind of covers uh, the history of this neighborhood. Uh, this uh, is a uh, diverse community made up of uh, Cape Verdeans, uh, Hispanics, uh, African Americans, white folks um, in the Roxbury uh, neighborhood of, um, of, of Boston. Um, a small subsection of it is called the Lee Village. And so this is the overall kind of Roxbury uh, community here. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, uh, with Boston, here's Massachusetts Avenue, major thoroughfare. And so this little area here uh, in the 1980s was really run down and derelict. This map on the left, apologies for the graininess of the images, uh, but just to give you a sense, all the black areas uh, connote vacant lots, right? And um, the area was rapidly gentrifying. There was a lot of crime. There was blight. Blight is one of the determining factors, right? For, uh, uh, prevalence of vacant lots of uh, abandonment of uh, dirt rubble um, was kind of used as a defining term to basically uh, renew for urban renewal to basically uh, you know kind of clear through certain areas um, and rebuild and um, so what these uh, folks did was that they organized this community with assistance from uh, some local uh, academics uh, with assistance from a local foundation they were able to start um, kind of organizing at a grassroots level, um, organizing their community to understand what everyone's needs were and to try to doggedly work to meet them. And they started this effort in 1984, uh, 28 years later. Uh, this is the footprint that they now own. Uh, apologies, you can't see the legend here, uh, but this kind of kaleidoscope of different colors is representing all the different developments um, that this Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative has been, in, been able been able to um, get their hands on. So they, it says it up here, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative owned parcels in the Dudley Triangle. Uh, they've been able to build everything from single family houses to multifamily properties. Locally uh, in South Florida, uh, there's the South Florida Community Land Trust. Um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative a couple of years ago also started their own community land trust model. Uh, that's a strategy that is being adopted across the country uh, that seeks to basically buy in a nutshell, buy property at today's prices and uh, develop on that land. And rather than relinquish or sell uh, the property and the land underneath it outright to a new buyer, what they do is they provide a 99 year, up to 99 year lease for the use of the building. They retain the ownership of the land. Um, and so in that fashion, they're able to retain um, the cost of the land at a certain uh, level um, and within that model, eventually people are able to decide whether, choose whether they want to stay in place or whether they want to move out. And they're able to basically 
take out some of the equity that they've put into the house. And so it becomes a great model for uh, perpetuity. Uh, these are some of the houses that they build. I believe this is a house that they built in West Palm Beach, uh, which was designed for home ownership. The lack of home ownership, if you remember from the uh, documentary, is one of the ways that people have really become displaced. So hold right. on, if, so, if I, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I did and have lastly, a we're just going to show this example in Denver uh, of the Mariposa uh, Supportive Healthy Redevelopment, which was uh, led by the Denver Housing Authority, uh, who had the vision and foresight to uh, basically organize a charrette and engage the community and identify what the community's desires were for revitalizing a new area of the uh, community. And the neighbors basically asked for mixed income housing uh, with um, access to jobs. This is what the community kind of looks like. It's close to transit. Um, it is mixed income. Uh, it seems livable. It is a hard user example of uh, smart growth. And last but not least, uh, amongst the better practices that are happening right now, the city of Portland, Oregon, um, has decided to eliminate single family housing uh, as a zoning uh, typology, citing that it has been one of the most divisive zoning practices in the country. And what they're advocating for is that it doesn't mean that you can't retain a single family house if you have that. It just means that anyone else that wants to either build an accessory dwelling unit in the back or a granny flat, or if they want to build up to a triplex, quadplex, three-story walk-up, right, that they can do that and that it doesn't necessarily destroy the character of the neighborhood allows for additional density um, and allows for a mix of incomes to incorporate. So anyway, I've said my piece. I think I have now <laughs> gone <No>. over. <laughs> well, I just had a few questions because yeah. I mean, I think that we, um, it's nice to see and hear about these other organizations in other areas who are trying to, you know, help um, the negative effects, but are there any organizations here in Miami or South Florida um, that are trying to undo some of the negative consequences of redlining here in Miami. Because um, I think that's, again, it goes back to the solutions for us um, as things are quickly moving, over time's quickly changing, and it's been changing for a very long time. What are the organizations here that are helping kind of mitigate that or trying their best to stop these negative effects? Sure. So um, there are a number of different organizations. Um, I do see Christine Rupp has her hand up. I don't know if yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody uh, can she, ask. She's questions. one of the organizations, she represents one of the organizations, Data Heritage Trust, um, that has been working, for instance, on documenting uh, the history of Liberty Square. Um, that doesn't necessarily speak to redlining, but it speaks to at least capturing uh, the history uh, of, of what has happened there so that, you know, we can kind of have like, you know, historical uh, uh, log to, to look back at. And I'm just gonna um, just answer the question and then, and then maybe we can give Christine an opportunity to say something. There are a number of different organizations um, at different levels, right? So I would say that there are people within, uh, you know, the city administration, the county administration um, that are really focused on this. Um, there are uh, nonprofit organizations and advocacy groups like the People Acting for Community Together Pact. Um, there are nonprofit builders. There are some private builders that are also building affordable housing. Now, um, in terms of who's actually specifically and concretely addressing the long-term impacts of redlining, that becomes a little bit more tricky, right? Because when we talk about uh, building affordable housing, for instance, um, is affordable housing necessarily a solution to redlining? Um, I think it's not necessarily always the same conversation, right? And so when we're talking afford about affordable housing, um, there's a large problem because we have to ask ourselves affordable to who, right? So if we look at, um, you know, uh, the redevelopment that's happening in Overtown, for instance, where they have a community redevelopment um, uh, agency, um, one of the complaints by a lot of the legacy African-American residents of the neighborhood is that the CRA has not done enough to supply uh, housing that is truly affordable to their income needs, right? Uh, a lot of the affordable housing uh, that gets built is typically workforce housing, uh, which is accept only accessible to people making, earning at the top 
levels of the affordability scale, right? And this is where we begin to perhaps uh, get a little bit into right. the weeds because, you know, so many definitions, you know, uh, you know, what are we talking about when we're, when we're you know, uh, when we're talking about redlining, so. Um, yeah, and so I, I think, um, you know, Christine has dropped a lot of good gems in the chat for us, so we're gonna let her um, go. So feel free to unmute yourself, Christine, and introduce and ask your question. Thank you so much, and um, Hernan, thank you so much for your expertise. I, Hernan and I go back a, a ways, and um, it's always a pleasure to work with him. So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on, on the work that we're doing in Brownsville, because while it, it, it doesn't specifically address redlining, it does address planning and zoning decisions that are being made today. So Miami-Dade County has something called the SMART plan for transit, right? And it has these transit nodes that if you look at the map, ultimately impact African-American neighborhoods in unincorporated Miami-Dade County. Brownsville, where we're doing our historic survey work, is, a tra is traditionally a single family home African-American community. Um, a, a result of, of, of the past and those policies, but a neighborhood with a great history and heritage. And now the rezoning due to the SMART plan, which will effectively wipe out the single family home zoning and disrupt this neighborhood is just a continuation. These policies just continue today. And what we're finding with the survey work that we're doing is that planning and zoning in the county never took a look at the history of these neighborhoods, never took a look at the historic fabric of these neighborhoods and just made these blanket rezoning, upzoning um, requirements without ever looking at the history, the heritage or the residents of, of these neighborhoods and, and what, what it meant for that neighborhood and what, what continues today. So I, I have to tell you, I've, I'm, I'm just horrified knowing what I know in that film. And I'm reading a book called A World More Concrete and it, the policies that led us to where we are today um, as everyone knows, have got to be changed. And that, that to me is the biggest challenge where we go from here. And just on a personal note, you know, um, I was born and raised in Toledo, Ohio, which is a, a mini Detroit and born and raised, you know, listening to Motown and, and Afro-American culture while not a, a, a part of my life on a day-to-day -day basis certainly was, um, a part of life in Toledo. And it makes me sad that these policies that were enacted kept me away from, from African-Americans and getting to know African-Americans. And, 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 and I think it cheated everybody that we, we were not in integrated neighborhoods and didn't have a chance to get to know each other. And I think we, we have got to be mindful of that going forward because it's going to do nothing but enrich us as people. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, I know we haven't, we've never met, but I've heard a lot about you from Naomi. She, um, she, she loves you. Um, so thank you so much for your work and all of your efforts and advocacy um, on neighborhoods. Um, I'm going to cue in Anthony. I see that he has his hand raised. Feel free to unmute yourself. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing great. Uh, I'm a junior here at FIU, uh, third year of my five-year program. Uh, so my question to you all is, given the opinions and knowledge of the world today, what do you think the future holds in the aspect of socioeconomic redlining and discriminative policies? Karnan, I think you're muted. Apologies. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, kind of looking to the future, it's important to kind of look to the past, right? And look at what, uh, for instance, what uh, Christina was just talking about, right? Um, I think that it's, it's you know, uh, it's important for us to, to be, to be realistic and acknowledge, right? I'm trying to, I've been trying to be, 
to remain positive <laughs> to yeah. a certain degree. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, it has to start with having these conversations, you know, these, these, these conversations are not easy uh, to have. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that it's an important conversation for us to have within the space. And when I say the space, it is the space of the AIA Miami of NOMA, where it's important to remember that even within our own industry, right? Uh, in the, the documentary was talking about the importance of diverse groups of people making decisions. Um, and it's important to remember that on a good day, right, the current uh, membership of AIA, of the Professional Organization of Architects, reports that 2% of the industry is Black, right? Uh, and so when you consider that, you know, everything that we're talking about redlining, it's really about the built environment. Well, who is designing, who is affecting, who has been affecting the built environment, right? Um, it is us. And so... Um, I'm optimistic, right, to see um, how many more people are learning about this and informing themselves and actively pursuing solutions and really asking themselves, what is it going to take for us, right, to to overcome this? Um, so um, I also want to add. I try to, I try to remain optimistic at the same time that we're seeing all of these, you know, kind of this kind of wave of pushback, kind of naturally, uh, because I think it's important to recognize, right, that that there is a certain <laughs> wave of pushback that is happening at the same time that we're beginning to open up this dialogue. Right, and in response to that, I think, you know, it kind of goes in, along with Anthony's question and your response. And as designers, as, you know, African-Americans and minorities and the 2%, all these numbers that we hear and kind of the responsibility that's laid on us under the realm and the profession, the profession of architecture itself, and it's demanding, you know. Um, so, how do we, as designers, as professionals, as students, like, what are some actionable items that we can do? What can we participate in to combat redlining? Because you know, even students now are engaging, asking, like, questioning the future. Um, so, I think it's important for us again that solution what are some of those those actionable items that we can do to make sure we held ourselves accountable independently as well and i just want to add that there's other ways of not only as architects but how we empower our community um in west philly they have the jumpstart west philly program so if you're a native of west philly you get access to capital once you complete their developer training program and it's not folks who studied real estate who, you know, went to the fancy schools and got the degrees. It's actual folks in the neighborhood who are given capital to actually revive their neighborhood mm -hmm. versus, you know, what we're experiencing here in Miami, which is many um, non-natives um, coming. I'm trying to be, you know, polite about it, but non-natives coming, um, doing what they're doing, heading out and yeah. cashing in their checks, right? Versus actually empowering these communities you walk you go into liberty square or um over town and it is becoming less populated so how do we how do we keep folks from leaving to to kind so, of um, so go ahead Naomi. Go so you know my question that i put in the chat kind of ties into you know your presentation what anthony said and what terry said and it it kind of um even though you're, you know, you're in the community and you are an architect and you're doing all of these things and you're very much aware and you're an advocate for all these different things, you you kind of are um, stopped or or you're um, you don't have the ability to do much because you know. So you showed the picture of Overton and the highway that went through Overton and what Overton was before, right? And I've lived in Overton for 16 years. And, you know, you hear those stories and you go, okay, well, you know, that happened, you know, years and years and years ago in the 50s and so forth and all these, you know, highways that go through all these predominantly, you know, thriving Black neighborhoods or even, um, you know, uh, stadiums like in St. Petersburg that has, that has happened, right? And all these predominantly Black neighborhoods, they're just torn down homes you know, and gone right through. And you go, well, Okay, that happened in the 50s. Well, I'm telling you, it's happening right now in Overtown. I mean, Nadine and Terry and Tiffany and Vanessa Open are sick and tired of hearing me saying it. Yep. Exactly. Oh. And, you know, 
Naomi, you and Massive. I both live in Overtown. So this is true. Terry does. You know we that. had to hear the piles, the buildings, the the the. It was you know inc- uncomfortable for months um, at a time. So and they've torn down all these you know black owned businesses to put up even larger, more highways. So why is that still happening? <laughs> I don't know if you have the answer yeah. or none, but you know, why is it so Well, happening? I would say, I would say that it is happening. That's one of the reasons that I was um, trying to, you know, include some of these models like the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, it's happening because some of the similar practices that happened back in the day are still occurring. Uh, locally, there's a lack of transparency, right? Um, there, the political will is not there. And then you couple that with it being a very transient neighbor community right, where, um, you know, try to identify somebody that's a true native of Miami, that's becoming increasingly uh, more difficult. And so, you know, um, that and then the lack of ownership, right? So all those things kind of put together, uh, you know, make it really difficult. It becomes really difficult in a country that prides itself so much on individual private property rights uh, to have any influence on what happens in the built environment that you don't own. Right? Um, so the, the, the lack of homeownership has always been a, a, a problem. It continues to be an increasing problem. Homeownership is not going up, it's going down, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, currently we're at 35% homeownership in Miami-Dade County, right? And if you look at the majority of the affordable housing that's being built, it's not for ownership, it is for rent. So that means that that's only going to be a temporary solution and that at some point, those people are going to continue to be subject to market pressures. And Miami so, was just dubbed the highest, you know, um, real estate, you know, in the country. It's the least affordable. There's a lot of speculation that's happening, you know, and at the same time that, you know, that we're finally getting a conscience, we're also continuing to deal with what was happening prior to the pandemic, right? Prior to the pandemic, a thousand plus people a week were moving to South Florida. There was a little bit of a lull during COVID, and now people are coming in droves again, right? Uh, attracted by the promise of, uh, you know, no state income tax, uh, of more clement weather, uh, and all these things. Um, so all of that, all of that, all of that, on. all of that. All of that is happening, right? Right, because I'm from New York, so I'm not going to lie. The, the, the beach <laughs> and the sun, and the sun was, was a great thing. But at the end of the day, um, there's certain things that people, I think, we need to touch base on. And, and I think you can speak to it a little bit more, is that it was clear what redlining was done, how redlining was done in the past, right? It was in your face. You saw, you saw the, the laws. You saw the rules. Everything was, it wasn't, it wasn't hidden, right? But now it's still happening. However, there's, the laws aren't there, right? So, so where did this redlining come? Like, how are the polls? What are those little, <laughs> you know, the inclinations that your area is really starting to be redlined? And it starts off slow. It's not going to be in your face. So, what are these things? How can we recognize them? And can you speak to that so that, you know, we learn to stop it? We learn to like nip it in the bud before it really gets to be that that big of an issue um, where we learn to get on our legislative boards before it becomes that big of an issue. At what point in time is it, are, are, are these redlining things really starting to creep up when it's not really called redlining? Can I, can I have a question to kind of counter that? Maybe you can speak on this or none, but you know, when these were advertised, these were mm-hmm. security maps to insure homeowner loans, right? It was an idea that you know, here's something to support this effort and encourage to reduce risk, is to reduce risk yeah. and to encourage it. So, you know, now we call it redlining. When this was done in the 30s, we were not calling it redlining. We were calling them security maps or zoning maps. And, you know, I am curious if today there's kind of those hidden messages in certain incentives, right? That was an incentive then that we have seen the after effects and the incredibly negative and problematic after effects. Are those things still existing today in different kinds of um, language and rhetoric or how do we give folks access to that? Well, you can see it, right? Of course, but I don't think- If the question is still in the air, chances are it's still going on. That's what I Well, of course, it's still going on, but it's so, it's like, like Tiffany says, it's not something that's 
a parent. It's not um, back in the day, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was more intentional, right? It, and not that it's not intentional now, but it's it's blatantly intentional as I'm helping you because I know I'm hurting that, right? But now, what are those like like Tiffany? What are these little incentives that looks like? everything that glitters isn't gold that it looks like it's good but it's really it's really not like what are those little things and gregory also asked well, the question instance, how do we identify the difference between modern redlining yeah to lack of buying power well it's about coding right yep. uh, part of it is about coding some of the some of it is about language right so for instance when we start talking about housing and housing affordability oh my god we open up pandora's box right where now we gotta go through a whole education wait what are you talking about ami what is that area median income and what does that represent and so you have these ranges right oh extremely low income zero to thirty percent of ami blah, blah blah and so it becomes this abstract notion right um and rather than being able to know okay this is a person making you know this is a you know person working in the service industry you know making under twenty thousand dollars a year now that becomes palatable rather than it's percentage ranges right um and so it's these these notions of not understanding really the the language, right? There's there's there's, there's a, a an element of, of speaking different languages and this need for translation uh, uh, that occurs, right? There's also you know you know did anyone hear about this thing about micro housing, right? And how it's becoming so so sexy, uh, quote, quote, <laughs> and it's like wait a second, did could we just you, forget? Could you elaborate more on that? Micro housing, right? So mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, you know, so micro housing is uh, referring to small footprint housing, right? Um, if you think of, you know, kind of Le Corbusier and the modular, right? We're all, we, a lot of us are architects on this call. Um, by the way, thank you to all the architecture students that have come out, uh, you know, and, and participated, um, you know, hoping that you're seeing the value of engaging here. Um, you know, so so micro housing um, and the the, mod the modular and the Corbusier was trying to explore, trying to understand what is the minimum space that a uh, human needs to to kind of live, right? And um, well, right, we saw we were just talking in class before about <laughs> the contemporary city, right? The unité d'habitation produced these um, you know large public housing towers that became you know that you know spread like wildfire throughout the United States. And then starting with the Pruitt Igo, we started to tear them down because what we realized was that we had basically stripped all the different services um, that were important. You know, um, it's my son. Um, me too. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's talking about micro housing, right? Yeah. And so, um, right, so you have, uh, right, so, so, uh, we had this experiment of, right, um, based on pricing, right, you know, housing is costly, like, you know, how do we supply housing for all these people? Oh, we build these micro units, right? We had single room occupancy, right, uh, for, for, for males, all these different small footprint typologies that wind up creating adverse conditions, right? It was like, uh, maybe putting all these, you know, men living in poverty, single men, you know, with a lot of frustration and all this, maybe that wasn't the best recipe. Maybe that was actually a recipe for disaster. So, you know, across the United States and internationally, you know, that level of micro housing um, has quickly been banished and, 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 you know, and destroyed. And now we're seeing a resurgence, right? Oh, micro housing. So I remember a couple of years ago, seeing a video of Carlos Jimenez, the then uh, county mayor, touring a new micro housing development. And I remember hearing something like, wow, who knew 300 square feet could look so large, you know? And I'm like, wait, wait, we've already seen this, 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 we've already seen this, this, this picture, you know, what, what, yeah. what is happening? So, um, you know, and, and as I say that, you know, I was talking before about blight and in, I teach an urban design theory class at, at FIU, which some of my students probably remember, I asked on the first day, I'd show a picture of the Bronx burning, right? Which, you know, when I was growing up in, in the 80s and the 90s, you know, it was just like, you saw the picture and you knew what that was. You knew that that was blight, right? That was what it was. And I asked my students, hey, what is this? You know, and, and, and the last word that they bring up is blight. And yet, when you look at the definition of, you know, what is the community development area intended to do? What is clearance intended to do? 
you know, what were the policies uh, that were created to try to, you know, uh, overcome, com you know, uh, long-term disinvestment in, uh, under the moniker community development, what was all intended to do? To remove slum and blight. Yeah. Right? And so they so, were referring into the documentary to blockbusting and as a thing of the past, but I would argue that blockbusting is happening today. Right. Know, and it's, areas, it's, right? I uh, think community it's development a, areas, they finally figured out some communities, you know, governments have kind of figured out that, you know, perhaps, you know, because there is blight, you're getting dollars to try to remediate these things. And so, yeah. You know, and I, I just, I think it's preserved, right? Yeah. And it's, it's so many things that we, these, these topics are very, um, are these discussions are so hard because we can go on forever because they're, they touch like all of us, whether it's in our past, our current, our future. Um, and it's something that's very personable. So, you know, I do want to thank you. Um, and I guess to wrap up, because I want to make sure we, we've gone over a little bit, um, yeah. but I just want to ask the last question, if we can answer it in 30 seconds, now what? Like, what is the, the now what? What's the one quick thing we can leave with our viewers to keep them motivated on this topic and, and keep them active and advocating? My now what would be that um, as designers, it's important for us to, to speak our voices. I think that in general, as designers, we're very much, you know, into problem solving. We get caught up in formal decisions and really important things that, you know, we shouldn't be sidestepping. Um, and, and, and so I think that there's that. And I think that increasingly, you know, the pandemic hasn't helped this kind of isolation, uh, but I think it's important for us to have these forums to be able to connect with each other, right? And to remember that we're not alone, right? And to continue to think about solutions. Um, and I would say that the only place that we operate is not just, you know, on the computer or drafting or designing. Right. We right. also have to take on these other roles, like being a part of these forums, like right. uh, taking on certain roles, you know, um, our design is regulated by things like zoning, right? Yeah. Great zoning, yeah. the planning zoning advisory board, right? You can sit on those committees um, in your local municipality, right? So it behooves us as designers uh, to not only have the design voice and the important voice of illustrators and, and designers, yeah. uh, but to sometimes also lend that kind of advocacy policy uh, voice to be a part of uh, planning and zoning advisory boards, urban design review boards, and et cetera. And that's my piece. Thank right. you so much. No, thank you. And we appreciate you for being an advocate. Um, of course, Noma will continue to be an advocate in Miami in the best ways that we can. Um, if any of our listeners, um, again, you all have been also a great um, resource through our chat. We've learned a lot through you all and your participation. Um, so we just want to say thank you to everyone. We're going to you know, go ahead and wrap up. Um, but I do want to give a, a special thank you to um, chair and co-chair uh, Tiffany and Tiffany Montone, Montone and Nadine St. Lou for throwing this event. Uh, they put in a lot of work. And um, this was, a, again, the topic, uh, especially during Black History Month, was a great idea. So I want to thank them and everyone give them a little congrats. Um, and we hope everyone enjoyed uh, today. We hope that you enjoyed the film. If you've not had a chance to read the book, you know, um, as Hernan said, and as we continue, Tiffany is holding it up for you right now. Um, as we keep saying, it is a very, really good read. Um, I myself have not, I'm going to be honest, I have not read it um, in, entirely, um, but I plan on completing it. Um, you know, ARES are taking over for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. That's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need so more I'm, registered architects. That's right. what we also so need, more registered I'm dipping in Tiffany, architects. myself, Naomi, yeah. we're kind of dipping in and out, but we, we're trying to stay active as much as possible on our ends, on our day-to-day, -day, so... Um, again, we, we thank and I was just gonna I was just gonna add sorry um, Christine That's also okay. pointed out another book which is really great right um, the Leland Roth book is really great right it talks about um, the, the national uh, issues right um, but a world more concrete really focuses in South Florida mm -hmm. a world more concrete okay. I don't know if you want to thank you much. so much I think you're gonna drop it in the chat for us um, sorry yeah
Great. So if anyone is interested in, in that book, feel free to grab the link before we close out. Um, again, thank you, AIA Miami, Colleen, everyone who is behind the scenes, always making sure these events are su successful. Um, and we hope uh, you all stay um, connected. Um, look out for your AIA Miami emails, NOMA emails, so that you stay active with us in our future events. And we hope you all have a good evening. And thank you again, Hernan. We appreciate you and, and being our guest speaker for the night. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Uh, no problem. Okay, bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you all. I am just going to try to save the chat real quick. Um, I have the chats because I recorded oh. this. It should all be. Um, oh, beautiful. Yeah, it should all be recorded. OK, wonderful. Thanks, everybody. This was really amazing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, I'm going to shut it down. Yes, I'll shoot you a, a Zoom link in a moment. Okay, thank you. A Zoom thank link? For what? No, for, Nate, for Nadine, for Nadine. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Like, nah, what? <laughs> no, no, we're done. You're done. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. <laughs>